thank you very much. So um, from that description, um, you can see I've spent like the last five years answering other people's questions about outcomes. And you get to hear a little bit about um, uh, the fruit of those efforts. And so um, there's three topics I want to talk about today. And I'm going to try to cover them all relatively quickly. Um, the first topic I want to talk about is um, Starting with the framework of what do we, how do we envision that after school programs are having an impact on youth outcomes? So what pathways uh, do we see these programs taking, uh, ultimately that result in positive developmental uh, outcomes for youth? Then I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about what we've learned from all the evaluation work that we've been doing about the impact of these programs on youth outcomes. Now most of the work that I have done over the last several years has been connected to the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program in some way, which means that many of the outcomes we've been taking a look at have been school-related outcomes, and we're going to see some evidence of that today. And then finally, we've been doing some work to look at the relationship between participation in higher quality programs versus lower quality, and what that means for youth outcomes. How much additional bang for your buck do you get if kids are enrolled in higher quality programs? So let's start first with this kind of pathway document. And I'm going to admit, um, I'm a person who likes to steal other people's stuff all the time. And I've been uh, working uh, with Charles for a while. And so some of what I'm going to talk about is very similar to Karen Pittman's uh, presentation of Charles Quest, my at the Weicker Center. We have a little bit of different take on it, so I just want to talk through that real quick. So when we're thinking about the ways in which programs have an impact on youth, we want to start from this perspective of quality. And really, I've been thinking about quality falling in two camps. Um, one is what I would call universal process quality. And these are all the things that Karen Pittman was talking about. All of these positive youth development nutrients that create nurturing, caring, supportive, interactive environments for youth to develop in. And it doesn't matter if it's chess club. It doesn't matter if it's um, a service learning opportunity. You want these things to be present. They're consistent and universal. It's really the power of youth development in many respects. And increasingly, states are looking to these types of frameworks to think about states and locales and people who design program systems are looking at frameworks that help articulate what are these things and how do I get them into my program. The second component to quality, in my mind in some respects, is more of what we call, or what I've been calling, pathway-specific intentional practices. And what we mean by that, it, it, it's building off, for example, Durlach and Weisberg's work, which focused on the, demonstrated the power of social and emotional learning for supporting positive youth development. But if you dig into those Durlach and Weisberg studies, what you realize is that those things didn't happen accidentally. People were very, who designed those experiences for youth were very intentional about the types of skills that they were trying to build. The same may be true for a STEM program that's really trying to spark kids' interest in STEM uh, provide them with the opportunities to grow that interest. Doing that well doesn't happen accidentally, and there's some things that you can do to support that that is STEM specific. All right. In addition to that, we want to get kids there, right? We want them to participate. That's what Jen uh, talked about during the course of her presentation. And we want them engaged, right? So we want quality, we want kids attending, we want them to be engaged. Most of the programs that I have worked in think about youth outcomes in three primary ways. The first way is that a lot of programs talk about outcomes in terms of what's going to happen in terms of academic skill building, um, especially for the programs I work with that are funded by 21st CCLC. This is a core component of the outcomes that they're interested in. And this can span from building kids' procedural knowledge, giving them an opportunity to practice skills, but it also could mean building academic mindsets, um, that, that, that effort counts in terms of building these skills. And then the sweet spot for after school are these project-based and inquiry-based approaches where kids get to engage really deeply with content and generate a tremendous degree of understanding. And so some of the programs are really focusing on those types of outcomes. Social emotional learning, we know, is increasingly becoming a focus, has always been present in the after school. The two have always gone together. The field is really talking about how to understand and measure those things more formally. And I know Charles is going to dedicate some of his presentation to talking about that. And then 21st century skills and competency, things like the ability to collaborate and develop communication skills or develop technological skills that are going to be important for the work phase. Um, these are the types of things that we typically see in outcomes. And the goal is that kids will develop these skills within after school programs 
and then be able to apply those skills, those beliefs, that great functioning in other environments, whether it be school or in the workforce. So most of what I'm going to talk about today, unfortunately, maybe in some respects, is going to be all the way over on that transfer side of the outcomes, because that's what people are interested in who pay me to do their outcome analyses. They want to know what's happening in that last box, okay? So the first item, what I'm going to share with you is in that box, and then I'm going to go back and take a look at the universal process quality and try to get a sense of if we can measure quality, these nurturing, caring, supportive, interactive environments full of the youth development nutrients that we talked about this morning, what does that mean for those transfer outcomes at the, all the way at the end of the box? So what have we been up to? So in the last three years, we have done eight impact studies in five states, and these have been part of the 21st Century Community Learning Centers programs. So Oregon, Washington, Texas, New Jersey, Rhode Island, I'm based in Chicago, so I do a lot of flying. I'm in a lot of different parts of the country over the course of the year. And each part of each of these evaluations we did were all had a component where we were trying to answer a consistent uh, question. What impact did regular participation in 21st CCLC have on youth outcomes as compared to similar youth not participating in the program? That's the core question we were trying to answer across each of these five states. Now, all the analyses we did, these eight impact analyses, we're only looking at one year of participation. Why? Because about 70% of the kids who participate in these programs only participate for one year. So it um, says something, I think, about what we know about what's working well in these programs and what may not be working well. We looked at participation rates at 30 and 60 days, did separate analysis for each, so there's some policy reasons why we looked at those, those levels of participation. And we did these analyses in the way we were trying to mimic random assignment. We couldn't do random assignment, obviously, but we were trying to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between those youth that were participating in the program versus those that were not. And the way we did this is we had access to basically all of the data that states have, state school systems have about kids. So we had access to all the student information that these data sets, uh, these databases, the state data warehouses have accumulated past performance, demographic characteristics, zip code information, for example. And we had all their school-related information. So we knew a lot of things about the schools in question, what staffing looked like in those schools, what performance looked like in those schools, things of that nature. And basically, we used that information to try to craft a meaningful non-participant group. Okay, so we've controlled for a lot of stuff in these models that make it some, that we're confident we can say some causal things about it, but we haven't controlled for everything, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so what do we found? These programs are all oriented at supporting growth in reading and mathematics performance. That's why 21st CCLC is funded. And what we found is a consistent track record of positive results in supporting these, but the effects are very, 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 very small in terms of supporting uh, increases in mathematics and, and reading performance. Now, the reality is, if you go back to 2004, Thomas came with this very interesting paper, right, about what can you expect out of an after-school program in terms of impacting assessment results. And the argument he made, and it's fairly convincing in my mind, is that if you spend a whole year in school and you look at a year of full-time in school that the impact is going to be about an effect size of 0.03 to 0.5, okay? After school programs, because of the amount of time we have kids, can only expect to really have an impact on uh, assessment results around the 0.5 to 0.10 level. What we're seeing is that most of the programs that are funded by 21st CCLC are consistent with one would expect given the dosage. Again, we're not controlling for quality. This is just overall average effect. Some of the effect sizes for things that the high school level were slightly higher. Uh, for example, cumulative GPA and uh, credits earned, we saw still small effects, but reasonable effects. Um, as a point of comparison, um, the Institute for Educational Sciences, uh, about three years ago, was trying to get an experiment off the ground. And in that experiment, they were going to test out an expanded day model. And in this expanded day model, they were going to give every single school in the treatment condition a half-time coach to help them implement the model. So this isn't 100 sites. So 50 of these schools were going to get a, a half-time coach to help them implement ALT. They were hoping to get an effect size on achievement of about 0.15 through those efforts. And so some of what we're seeing in some of the secondary programs are kind of at and above that level on those outcomes. 
Now, we also looked at a variety of kind of behavioral-related uh, indicators through the data sets that we were looking at. So we looked at things like grade promotion. Did it enhance the likelihood that kids are going to be promoted to the next grade level? Uh, did we see reductions in unexcused absences? Did we see reductions in disciplinary referrals? And here are the mean effects across the five states that we're working in are much more interesting in my mind. These effect sizes are kind of in a moderate level, right? These are respectable effect sizes. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of what these numbers actually translate to. In one state that was involved in our study, um, or our statewide evaluations, that individuals who participated for 60 days or more in the program, as compared to the non-participants, had 70% fewer, un 70 fewer unexcused absences, right? So it's a fairly sizable amount. Uh, for high school students who were in one of our studies, um, they had a 97% greater likelihood of uh, earning the credits they needed to go to the next grade level as the, compared to those youth that weren't enrolled in the programs. So these are some interesting effects. They're worth talking about. They're worth articulating, okay? Now, one of the caveats, so I am a, a researcher by training, so I have to tell you all the things that's wrong with these numbers, right? And what could be happening, right? So even though we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to get as much information about these kids that we could from the state data warehouses that we have access to, we don't know how, we don't have information about everything that's happening in their lives. There's a lot of social ecologies that have an impact on whether or not a kid is going to not only be successful in some of the outcomes we're looking at, but whether or not they're going to participate in after school or not. So one of the things we're trying to do in our evaluations now is to collect more information about those social ecologies that kids come from, just to make sure that there isn't some other kind of selection factor that's really driving these outcomes. But these are promising, they're our minds, and a good place to start. Switching gears a little bit, I think I only have about seven minutes left, so I'll try to talk about this relatively quickly. These outcomes are better than what we've seen for 21st CCLC that have been reported nationally. Many in the room know that in about the early 2000s, there was a study done of the 21st CCLC program shortly after its implementation by Mathematica in which the program was deemed pretty much a failure. So this kind of information is very helpful in trying to say we've moved a lot. One of the things that's happened in the last decade is that after-school systems have made a substantial investment in quality through folks like David, the David E. Weikert Center, uh, folks at NIOS, for example, who have talked about what is quality, how do we measure it, how do we build structures to move it forward. And these quality improvement systems really are, have some really interesting characteristics that make them, I think, effective. One is that they have a tendency to be low stakes that we move people into this kind of self-reflection uh, via self-assessment where people in a safe space can understand what does quality look like? What are the nutrients that I need to really grow kids from a developmental standpoint? How am I doing? Where am I falling short? In addition, the, the systems that really work well have aligned training and technical assistance and supports. To, once they do identify those areas of grow, they have the opportunity to work on those things and to get better at them and that they're held accountable for going through the process, not necessarily the scores that they're getting. And this type of approach has been replicated in many places over time. And so it's kind of led us to ask the question, so what impact has this had? So if we use some of these frameworks, like the, the YPQA or the APTO that NIAS uses, and we basically try to put people into a higher versus lower quality camp using those measures, does it make a difference from a youth outcome perspective? And so we've recently completed three studies where we've looked at this particular question. One was a component of our Texas 21st CCLC evaluation where we selected 40 sites at random, went out and observed the heck out of those programs to assess quality and then looked at the outcomes that those kids had. And two of the other programs were with intermediate organizations in Palm Beach and Nashville who are building and deploying those quality improvement systems. And we took their existing data on quality We've got outcome data from the school districts to kind of understand, do we see this relationship present or not? So many of the outcomes we looked at were the same we looked at in our statewide evaluation. They were mostly school-related outcomes, so the list looks very similar. Um, we also asked the question in this case, um, does after-school program attendance, is it related to quality? You would expect that it would be, so we wanted to explore that. So what do we find? So we had five different types of outcomes we were looking at. In four of the five outcomes that we looked at, 
we found that significant relationship between being in a higher quality program versus a lower quality. I don't think I said this, and I should say this. What we meant by quality, these were the, the YPQA based scores. We, all these studies involved the YPQA in some way, and these are all measures of what I would call that universal process quality, those, those general features of high quality settings, it doesn't matter where you're at. In four of the five, there was, at least in two of the studies, we find a replication that, that quality mattered. So we saw in Palm Beach in Texas that longer duration uh, in after school, or quality was associated with longer duration of participation. So if you were in a high quality program, you were more likely to stay there over time. And this is important, uh, especially given a recent study by Deborah Van Dell that has been published, or is on the verge of being published, which showed that when kids stay continuously enrolled in high quality after school programs, that the achievement gap between higher income and lower income students in mathematics basically shrinks to nothing by fifth grade. So the fact that high quality kids, high quality programs are more apt to keep their kids is a really important finding in my mind. Uh, that we found in Texas and Nashville that if you're in a higher quality program, you had fewer uh, disciplinary referrals. Uh, Texas and Palm Beach, the enhanced likelihood of being promoted to the next grade level. And in two places, we actually saw this relationship in relation to achievement. In mathematics grades, uh, in Nashville, we saw higher mathematics grades in higher quality programs and uh, higher reading assessment scores in Texas. So there was this consistent kind of relationship that we would expect that seemed to be validated by what we found. Now, most of these effect sizes, though, were pretty small. They were on the smallest side of things. We were only looking at one year worth of participation, though. And again, there's more work to be done here, but we see it as a really promising start to looking at some of these, these more longitudinal effects. All right, so what, are, kind of, what is the takeaway, or what are kind of the, the narrative that we're looking at? So what we've seen is not even controlling for quality, that we see some interesting effects through our statewide evaluations. Small teeny weeny effects on, on achievement that we would expect. Uh, some bigger uh, uh, effect sizes on things that are related to attendance, uh, behavior, and, and, and grade promotion. That quality matters, that we have um, this, this connection between being in a higher quality program and its outcomes is something that we can document. And we see, the thing that, that fascinates me about some of the work that we've been doing on the quality side as well, is the potential that these systems have for really giving kids the types of opportunities we want them to have. One of the things that we've noticed in our studies, and it kind of works, it creates some problems for us because it introduces the idea that there might be some selection bias in our, our work, is that the most at-risk youth have a tendency to still participate in some of the lowest quality programs, even when there is, uh, we're dealing with a, a high need group overall, and we really see these quality improvement systems as an opportunity to, to begin closing that gap, to begin the, the process of really working um, to help practitioners understand what quality looks like and how you grow a quality program. Uh, so we really see these as, as, a, as an important component uh, moving ahead. So at the end of the day, we've found some very promising results. They, they tell a, 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 quite a bit of a, a different narrative, especially for the 21st CCLC program that has been typically reported, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to continue to unpack um, how this really, how quality programming really drives youth outcomes, and how we can turn around and build systems that really support those quality efforts. So I appreciate your time today, and thank you very much.